Welcome to the Sacred Family Podcast. This is part 9 of the Awaken Arise series, Out of Egypt, part 2, which is episode 14 of the Sacred Family Podcast. All right, so getting lift um, is the hardest part of uh, escaping Egypt. Uh, Egypt has a pull that uh, anyone trying to escape it uh, without uh, effort and without a conscious uh, direction, they'll get pulled back. And the reason is Egypt and the culture of Egypt is all around you it is the culture of the world um so getting out of the culture of the world really is is incredibly difficult especially since it surrounds you so one of the things that uh, god does is if we're not able to fully escape egypt maybe we have a partial covenant or we have um uh, we have something that is given to us, God uses that as a tutor. So the church, for instance, is an incubator. The church uh, may have some covenants, but not all of it. Uh, whatever God has given and whatever the people have been qualified for, God will use it. Um, and he'll use it to the benefit of each of us. So going into this, um, this is from uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, paragraph 49. For as the body is one and has many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are baptized unto one body, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we are bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one mem member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not the body, it is therefore, is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were, were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one body, where would be the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, say much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow, bestow much abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lack, and therefore should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. For one member is honored, all members rejoice. Now you are the body of Christ, the members in particular. Okay, that was quite a lot. So what is it saying? Well, this is an epistle written to the Ephesians, and it's written... Um, uh, as an exclusive, uh, uh, inclusive uh, text, meaning um, that the writer of this epistle, uh, which I believe was Paul, uh, Paul was writing to the Ephesians saying that God has set up 
um, his church in the uh, teachings and commandments. The church is identified as those who repent and come under him, uh, come unto him. He identifies those who have been baptized. And then he talks about how we're all one body, that one, one of us isn't greater than the other, and the eye isn't greater than the nose, and the nose isn't greater than the ear, and arm isn't greater than the foot, and, and so on. God uses tools like that. this, um, uh, educators, um, as incubators. Uh, he uses churches. He uses groups. He uses people. Um, and the reason why he does that is that it teaches us to work with other people. You can't um, have group salvation, which is what the purpose of this is, is salvation as a group. Uh, you can't do that as an individual. It's just not possible um, unless uh, you have mul uh, multiple personality disorder and uh, you're uh, um, coming in unity of all of your uh, eccentricities and multiple personalities. But I don't think that's a, that's a thing. Um, so as we come together, um, uh, God uses ways and tools for us to do that. Okay, so I really, really, really like this scripture because it, I mean, it puts it out. It just explains it so so well um I, it explains it so well because everything physical is a is something near something that is spiritual and our bodies are so he's using our bodies in a way to to show us something spiritual that something it's actually something we all need to learn individually in order us, for us to be a part of that body of Christ because it does mirror something that is a very spiritual truth so the one thing about this scripture too that i want to point out is that it's saying to the hand you're important don't compare yourself to a foot don't compare yourself to something to the ear each part of the body is extremely important and it's not only that but they need to know that they're important they can't just have someone tell them that they need to know and it says it something i can't remember how the scripture says it but it specifies it in the scripture that the hand needs to know how important the hand is and its job and what the hand needs to do in order to be a part of the whole. And the foot needs to know what the foot needs to do. And <clears throat> each individual needs to know exactly how important they are and what their job is and what God wants them to do. And then for them to become as a whole, that's the only way for everyone to know how important each of them are, not compare themselves to others, because then you'll have backbiting and contention and all of that. So you have to have that first. And then when they come together, if you have all that, and each has their part, that's the only way you can have the body of Christ. And I love that. And part, there was a, when I was having my faith transition, there was an experience that I had where God basically showed me how important I am and how important everyone around me is by God compared it to a symphony for me that kind of showed us as all instruments and how each one is super important to make an orchestra. Um, I don't know if that was in the beginning or not, but anyway, so that's how I saw it, but I saw how important I was. And it was the first time in my life that I saw me for me and stopped comparing myself to other people. And I realized how important I was and how I had a different role to play than anybody else. And there's no way anyone else could be me. And I don't think anyone could have opened my eyes to that besides God. But it's essential for each of us to have that in order to be a part of the whole. All right, perfect. And now, 
when there is a active dispensation or when there is a dispensation, um, the dispensation head has the opportunity to organize the body of Christ the way that he feels uh, would be beneficial and get that approved by God. Um, so going into another scripture, this is in uh, Teachings and Commandments 154. Um, it says, when God delivers a dispensation of the gospel to the earth, the head of that dispensation is granted the right and privilege of organizing the dispensation. As the head organizes their dispensation according to righteous principles and receives God approval of the pattern, the dispensation is established and remains in effect until apostasy necessitates another restoration. Adam was given the first dispensation and he patterned it after the order of heaven. Abraham was also given a dispensation, which he patterned after Adam's dispensation. Moses was given a dispensation, but established a different pattern for the children of Israel according to the hardness of their hearts, which dispensation John the Baptist brought to a lawful close. Jesus Christ began a new dispensation, which patterned in a manner to reflect Abraham's family, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mirrored in Peter, Jacob, and John. The twelve tribes led by the twelve sons of Jacob reflected in the twelve disciples, the 70 children of Jacob who entered Egypt at the time of Father Joseph reflected by uh, the 70. And thus Christ used his right to honor the family of Abraham. Joseph Smith was given a dispensation which he organized to honor the pattern of Christ established. Such is the right and privilege granted to those who stand at the head of dispensations of the gospel. Um, Adam was given dominion over the whole earth by the word of God, received the holy priesthood after the order of the son of God. Okay. So we talked about the hand, the foot, the body. When there is an active dispensation, the dispensation head has the ability to organize a dispensation, um, really the way that uh, he feels necessary, uh, according to the time that they live in according to their circumstances and needs and desires. Um, this goes back to the, the body of Christ um, because uh, you, it can be strictly organized or it can be loosely organized. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, it is uh, uh, according to lawful principles and uh, God's house is a house of order, so there is order in into it. Sometimes it's loose. Christ's dispensation was fairly loose. There was no uh, organization. There was no uh, incorporated entity in Rome or whatever. Um, uh, Joseph Smith's dispensation uh, was uh, uh, was much more structured. Um, some have pros, some have cons, um, but. Uh, as we uh, learn about what God's work is doing today, not yesterday, not 200 years ago, not 2,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago for Abraham, as we understand how God's working today, we can be a part of that body of Christ. Now, um, uh, when an active dispensation has happened, there are two bodies of Christ, uh, you could say. One is related to men and the priesthood. The other is related to women um, and the role women play. So I'm going to read just a little bit because this is uh, uh, always interesting to, to um, talk about. This is from the Nauvoo Relief Society Minutes. Um, and it says, President Smith read the revelation to Emma Smith from the book of Doctrine and Covenants and stated that she was ordained at that time the revelation was given to expound the scriptures to all and to teach the female part of the community and that she that not she alone but others may uh, attain to the same blessing the second epistle of john first verse was read to show the respect that respect was then had to the same thing and that why she was called the elect lady is because elected to preside. Now I'm actually going to pause here. I'll come back to that, but I want to read this. This is a uh, John, the revelator, John, the beloved, um, writing a, an epistle, um, 
And uh, this is what he writes. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth for truth's sake, which dwells in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be unto you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now I'm going to actually hop back and finish this. Elders Taylor then, uh, so before I hop back, that was uh, John the Revelator, John the Beloved, writing to the elect lady. Um, so in Christ's dispensation and in New Testament times, uh, there was a female counterpart, um, a female um, I, I place, a female organization. I, I shouldn't say organization because there was an organization, but it's a female group. Um, with an elect lady. Um, Elder Taylor was then appointed to ordain the counselors. He laid his hands on the head of Miss Cleveland and ordained her to be a counselor to the elect lady, even Emma Smith, to counsel and assist her in all things pertaining to her office. Uh, Elder T then laid his hands on the head of Miss Wheatney and ordained her to be a counselor to Miss Smith and, and president of the institution and all the privileges pertaining to the office. Um, and I'll finish with this. He then laid his hands on the head of Miss Smith and blessed her and confirmed upon her all the blessings which have been confirmed on her that she might be a mother in Israel and look to the wants of the needy and be a pattern of virtue and possess all the qualifications necessary for her to stand and preside and dignify her office to teach the females those principles requisite for their future usefulness. Okay. I th I always think that's always interesting to look at. Um, so the body of Christ is not just male. Um, it is male and female. All right. So I do have something to say about that, um, which I totally 100% agree. Um, I grew up really believing that I didn't really have a role as a woman. I, I didn't believe I had a right to priesthood, that I had priesthood at all, that it was all men, that it was, um, I, I didn't, you know, I really didn't see myself as having any role in the gospel of Christ. Like it, that's how I saw it. And I, when I went through a faith transition, I realized, um, how untrue that is that a men and women are different and but women are extremely important and they have every right to gospel uh, blessings as men do and it's going to maybe look different um but they do and when it's talking about um, them having this organization or creating this organization, it's not um, kind of what I grew up with where they have the organization, but they go to the men and say, okay, help tell us how to run this. No, it's, it's women going directly to God who is heavenly father and heavenly mother and asking them themselves, what do you want us to do? It's going straight to God. And then they are taught by women from the other side of the veil, telling them how to run things or how to, what to teach other women or what to, to do, what to learn. What, and it's, they are 100% the other, the counterpart to you know, the gospel, they are part of the body of Christ and they, they, they have their own running of things. They have their own learning. They have, um, I don't know if I'm saying this well, but like it's, there's 100% learning that's just the same as men. And it's not, it's not a one-sided thing. I just, I, I grew up learning it was a very one-sided thing, and it's it's not that way at all. It's 
you know, everything that men can receive in, in um, progressing, women can receive it too. And women help women receive that. Perfect. And that's really what the body of Christ um, is, is about. And in like what Megan said, um, this, this isn't said in the epistle, um, the Corinthians epistle, but um, the image of God is a man and a woman. So you would assume that the body is both the body of a woman and a man or a man and a woman. Uh, to reflect the appropriate image that the image of God is male and female. So I wanted, there was just one more thing that I thought would be a fun little read. Um, and this is still in the um, Nauvoo Relief Society minutes. This is from Eliza R. Snow. Uh, Eliza R. Snow rose and said that she felt to concur with the president with regard to the word benevolent and that many societies with which it had been associated were corrupt, that the popular institutions of the day would not be our guide, that as daughters of Zion, we should set an example for all the world, rather than confide ourselves to the course which had been hereto pursued. One of, uh, objection to the word relief is that the idea associated with it is that of the same calamity, and that we intend appropriating on some extraordinary occasions instead of meeting the common occurrences. Okay. So what I wanted to highlight there is uh, Eliza R. Snow uh, stands up and says something to the effect of, uh, we are the daughters of Zion. We should not be following the example of the world, but we actually should set the pace. Uh, we should uh, set the example for the world. Now, that ultimately is the goal of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is meant to be a shining light on the hill or salt to, to preserve the world or leaven to leaven the world. It is also like the first slide that we started with. Um, it is designed to progress, to get a loft. Um, and hopefully uh, um, help us pursue to a more godlike people, um, ideally towards a covenant people and a covenant nation and Zion. Now, what happens when it doesn't do that? Well, we're going to talk about a couple examples. The first thing is um, the biggest crutch that happens with the body of Christ and with the believers uh, or the church is that they fall on their laurels and rely on the sacrifices of their ancestors and not on their own sacrifices. Um, and this is so true um, uh, throughout. So I'm going to read just a quick, uh, um, this is from uh, TNC 139. Behold, there are many called, but few chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men that they do not learn this one lesson, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected to the powers of heaven, and the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. That they may be conferred upon us, it is true. But when we undertake to cover our sins, to gratify our pride, our vain ambition, to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men, in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves, the spirit of the Lord is grieved, and when it is, when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or authority of that man. Behold, ere he is aware, he is left to himself to kick against the pricks, to persecute the saints, to fight against God, we have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, that they will begin immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Hence, many are called, few are chosen. Okay, so I wanted to read this uh, scripture uh, and highlight the many are called, few are chosen, and 
uh, because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. The great danger in religion is that um, the assumption or perception that participating in an organization by default grants you a level of salvation. And that level of salvation is given to you because of the sacrifices of your ancestors. Because your ancestors did something, uh, you suddenly get privy to the same blessings. And it doesn't matter if you're like a Zoramite and you think of God once a week um, on Sunday and you go out and try to, uh, uh, you know, take over the world or, you know, uh, pursue your, your career without thought of God. And regardless of all that, the first thing that happens is the power that was originally demonstrated in the religion, whether it was a dispensation or whatever, um, the original power that created the dispensation slowly trickles away like a river coming to uh, drying up, a dried up river. Um, and you can see that in all dispensations. Um, that slowly happens. So the first thing is, is um, the power leaves. And the power leaves because our hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and we aspire to the honors of men. Or we can go back to what um, I, Christ said in the Sacred Grove to Joseph Smith. Um, they teach for doctrines, the commandments of men. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Um, I, so um, I, denying the power of God Denying the power of God doesn't have to be outright denial, which many times that is, but it can be neglect and omission. It can be setting priorities where God is an afterthought or guaranteed salvation is how you believe religion works these days. Um, or God is not a God of miracles anymore. He's done his work and given his power unto man. Or you put um, a man before you, man before you before you go to God. So, like if you put um, the obedience to a man before obedience to God or the commandments that you've read in the scriptures or you read in the scriptures, if it's more important to follow a man, it's the same type of thing. Yeah. And the thing is, going on to the next slide, um, not only is it hard to get out of Egypt, the whole um, topic of this podcast is out of Egypt, but once you're out of Egypt, the pull back into Egypt or into Babylon um, is, is significant. And we can see that with the children of Israel. Um, they constantly were getting pulled back into the dominant culture of the day, especially when the dominant culture of the day was an empire or a large political foe or ally. Um, they constantly pull, got pulled into um, uh, falling into the traditions or the temptations or the culture of that neighbor, that foe, that ally. Now, this is a um, this is the um, dream or the vision of Daniel. This is when the Israelites were getting t taken captive back to Babylon. I'm going to read the the this just for a second. This is in Daniel chapter two, and this is him relating uh, the the dream uh, from King Nebuchadnezzar. And it says, you, O king, saw and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, 
his breast and, and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron, part clay, part of clay. You saw until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. So this is a, um, they're back in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. This dream has this image of a head of gold, uh, arms of silver, brass, uh, belly and thighs, and legs of iron. And it represented the um, four uh, empires, which uh, over the next 600 years until Christ would dominate the Israelite uh, land and uh, culture. Uh, so you have Babylonians, and then you have the Persians coming in, and then you have Alexander the Great with the Greeks, and then you have the Romans uh, taking over. With each one of these cultures, they or each one of these empires, they brought with them their culture. And ultimately, every single one had a significant impact on Israel. It was incredibly hard to have uh, independent Israeli or uh, Hebrew culture untainted by the dominant culture of the day. The same is true here uh, today. It is really hard not to be an American religion if you're in America or a Greek religion in Greek, the dominant or British religion in Britain, the dominant culture of the day um, in, 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 I, I want to say in fess or in flicks or um, uh, uh, takes over or uh, ultimately um, uh, the, the uh, doctrines, the thoughts, the theologies, the um, philosophies of the day ultimately take precedent and replace what was original. And so you can see corporatization of religion because corporate thought is the thought that is uh, taught by businessmen in business schools and those businessmen in business schools became, become leaders of churches and they uh, carry with them their business ideologies and their schools of thought into the religion. And the thing is, is this is not new. This is what happened when Christianity, early Christianity, um, I became uh, I popular and the dominant religion in Greece and Rome. Greek thought and the Hellenization of Christianity is ultimately what caused all the problems in the 3rd and 4th and 5th centuries um, after the death of the apostles. So what happens is the dominant cultures of the day uh, uh, have a uh, significant influence on changing the priorities and the thoughts and the philosophies of the religion of the day. Okay? Now, what then happens after that? Well, when the philosophies and the approaches um, are influenced so much that the arm of the flesh suddenly becomes the way by which you do business, suddenly you have wells without water. Let me explain that. I'm going to read this. Um, uh, this is from TNC uh, 157, and this is Christ talking, and he says, You pray each time you partake of the sacrament to always have my spirit to be with you. And what is my spirit? It is to love one another as I have loved you, 
Do my works and you will know my doctrine, for you will uncover hidden mysteries by obedience to these things that can be uncovered in no other way. This is the way I will restore knowledge to my people. If you return good for evil, you will cleanse yourself and know the joy of your master. You call me Lord and do well to regard me so, but to know your Lord is to love one another. Flee from the cares and longings that belong to Babylon. Obtain a new heart, for you have all been wounded. In me you shall find peace, and through me come Zion, will come Zion, a place of peace and safety. So the big thing that I wanted to highlight here is flee from the cares and longings of Babylon and obtain a new heart. Are those two things correlated? Is fleeing from the cares of the world and obtaining a new heart directly related? Is it our heart that is affected the most by the cares of Babylon? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to I'm going to put my uh, opinion there and the reason is it's in the heart that our ambitions and our desires lay. So if our ambition and our desire is to climb the corporate ladder, if it is to uh, make the million dollars, it is, if it's to be pretty or popular or cool or in the in crowd or whatever it may be, um, the new social media guru that has the many followers that says the, the funny things. But if that is our, where our heart is, that's where everything else will be as well. <clears throat> okay, in the scripture that he just read, it connects. Before it says obtaining a new heart, it says you love one another love one another is that how it says it um and so those are very direct or connected um when you are doing all those things that bryce just said who are you putting first you're putting yourself first well if you're loving other people if you're loving everyone else around you you're putting others first you're putting your family first, you're putting your friends first, you're putting your neighbors first. Everyone else is becoming first before you. You're becoming selfless. And so you have to love others first in order to obtain a new heart. Or you have to have that like that change in your heart of putting others before you before you. And that's why there's that connection. Yeah. Now rolling into the next scripture that's connected to this, this is Christ speaking. Um, and this is in uh, um, the testimony of John chapter four. And it's Jesus answered and said unto her, um, Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where then do you have that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank thereof himself, and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever shall drink of this well shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water which I shall give of him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give of him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So as we, as we look at um, the well without water and we're trying to get drink, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the water, and Jesus Christ is the water. So as we focus on the cares of the world and we get pulled back into uh, the cares of Babylon or the 
the beliefs of Egypt or the philosophies of men mingled with scripture um, that ultimately dries up our well. But as we turn towards the Lord and focus on the, the, the water of the Lord, that really puts it all together. Okay. Now, what then happens? Well, when we don't have water and we're focused on the cares of the world, um, it's almost like cosmetics. Um, if we're interested in eating food, we don't go to a cosm cosmetic, the, the cosmetic aisle of the grocery store because cosmetics just are, they're, they're, they're designed to make you pretty, but they have no substance. Uh, they're not going to get you full. They're not going to feed you. They're not going to make you not hungry. Um, but pure religion is, and we can always go back to pure religion. So this is in uh, uh, the epistle of Jacob in the New Testament. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the Father, listen the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the vices of the world. So pure religion is twofold. It is um, proactive. It is based off of avoiding the sins of omission and the sins of commission. It is doing things. So serving others, like Megan talked about, serving the fatherless and the widows. And it is avoiding things, avoiding the vices of the world. You don't have pure religion if you are okay with sin. If, you know, it's what everybody else is doing, or that's how everybody else talks, or that's the, those are the shows that everybody else watches, and that's okay. It doesn't really affect me because I'm above that. Well, that's not really pure religion. In addition, it's doing something. It's uh, um, keeping the Sabbath day holy. It is visiting the fatherless and the widows. Those provide us with the gospel of Jesus Christ that Christ talked about with the woman at the well and provides us with the living waters. All right. The next is related to the heart as well. There really is something to um, uh, your pocketbook related to where your heart is. Um, if your heart is focused on giving, um, supporting the widow, like the last scripture talked about, there that's where the rest of your body will be. But if you're your heart is more focused on expanding out your portfolio of stocks. Um, that will also have an indicator of where your heart is. So going to Malachi. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Going to Malachi says, even from the days, this is Malachi uh, paragraph seven. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, say the Lord of hosts. But you say, where shall we re return? Now I want to pause here before I continue on. Christ God is talking about ordinances, and he is referring to the payment of tithes as an ordinance. Will, you, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have you robbed, we robbed you in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes in the, to the storehouse that there may be food in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, say, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. You shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay? So, um, 
uh, God is referring to tithes and offerings as food for the storehouse, and he's referring to it as uh, an ordinance. So as we start thinking about ways that we can get pulled back into Babylon and the cares of Babylon and of Egypt, one of the ways and probably one of the largest ways is what do we do with our money? Do we focus on expanding out our portfolio? Do we focus on the next big project, the next big deal that we're going to close? Are we focused on um, uh, glorifying ourselves and our wealth, or are we focused on the widow and the fatherless and the poor? Um, that's a big key, and that's a big part of not being able to pull away from the cares of the world. The next, and Megan talked about this um, briefly, is putting somebody in, in between you and God. Um, idolatry. Uh, I'm going to read the Nauvoo Release Society minutes about this. Um, and this is Joseph Smith. And he says, President Joseph Smith rose and read the 14th chapter of Ezekiel and the, said the Lord had declared by the prophets that the people should each stand for himself and depend on no man or men in the state of corruption of the Jewish church. That righteous persons should only deliver their own souls, applied it to the present state of the church of Latter-day Saints, and said if the people departed from the Lord, they must fall. That they were depending on the prophet, hence were darkened in their minds from, the ne from neglect of themselves, envious toward the innocent, while they afflicted the virtuous with their shafts of envy. So, um, like Megan said, one of the main ways that we can uh, not be able to make lift into greater blessings, uh, more covenant favor with the Lord is idolatry. And ultimately, that's what it is. In um, the teachings and commandments, in the revelation of the three degrees of glory, I believe it's uh, section uh, 69 um, uh, in that and section 76 in the LDS version of the Doctrine and Covenants, talks about being some of one and some of another, some of Peter, some of Paul, uh, some of Apollos, some of Jesus. Um, and those were the ones who inherited the celestial glory. Because ultimately, our goal is for salvation. And the level of group salvation that you can achieve, meaning, do you have Egypt? Do you have a church? Do you have Israel or do you have Zion? The level of group salvation is based off of the cumulative individual salvation. So if you only have one person like Moses, um, then only one person is receiving saved. But even Moses brought 70 elders to the top of the mountain where they saw God. Christ standing in his glory. Um, if you only have one, like Elisha, then only one is getting saved to that degree. And this leads right into section 82 of the Teachings and Commandments. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter his rest, which rest is the fullness of his glory while in the wilderness. Okay? So um, the goal is <laughs> that we are to ascend individually, obtain individual salvation, so that we can obtain a higher group salvation. Um, now, what happens if those who are supposed to be guiding you up the mountain 
are ultimately the ones preventing you from going up the mountain. They have shut the gates. Um, they say no more. Uh, they put up stakes. Um, and they say, come, follow me. Uh, God has given his power unto man. He has finished his work. What happens then? Well, ultimately, the decay of the entire tree rapidly decays. If it's your leaders that are telling you that follow me, that's all you have to do, that is your salvation, check your brain out, um, all you have to do is listen and agree with us, then the tree will wither and decay at a very rapid pace until the tree needs an axe and chopped up. So that's a big, it's a big warning when uh, Joseph Smith said that you're darkened in your minds because of neglect of yourself. The next that we wanted to talk about is um, being righteous judges uh, in the sense that the goal is to be at the body of Christ and be accepting and to be patient and use persuasion and long suffering and gentleness and meekness and love unfeigned um, uh, to persuade and move the, the body of believers forward. But ultimately, when we are unrighteous judges, so the picture right here is of Eli, and then it also is of a high council room uh, for the LDS tradition, when we are unrighteous judge, judges, it's the same thing that I talked about just, just a second ago, that when the leaders are the ones that are the, the hindering block, the tree rapidly decays and the entire body can fall into apostasy very quickly because they're looking at false guides and false leaders, which ultimately aren't going to produce any fruit. <clears throat> interesting that um you'd put anyway <laughs> so having gone through an excommunication trial of the lds church something that i learned very starkly and unfortunately from that situation was the people judging me didn't really <laughs> um I'll try to put this as nicely as I can, but the biggest way I can say it is they didn't look on my heart at all. I bore my heart to them. I, in trying to defend myself, I, I bore my heart and that was my testimony was, it was straight from my heart and everything I said and I did was extraordinarily sincere and they didn't even bat an eye. They didn't even care. And I'm not going to go into that. It's just a righteous judge is going to look on the heart. And, and I, that's why I find it interesting that it says the heart judges in Israel, that you're going to be righteous judges by sincerely looking on the heart. Anyway. Well, and I think it also wraps back into – the philosophies of men, um, uh, the cultures and philosophies of the day, how they become so intertwined in the religion. You know, when I think of uh, uh, our excommunication trial, I actually think of Donald Trump's uh, uh, reality TV show, um, mm -hmm. The Apprentice, and it really felt like they just were firing us you're fired. And uh, there wasn't like any spirit behind the whole thing. They weren't, uh, they weren't uh, going by the gifts of the spirit, the spirit of discernment, the spirit of charity, the spirit of knowledge or wisdom. But uh, they were using a handbook of instruction to tell them what to do, similar to a fry maker at McDonald's learning how to roast fries. Um, uh, they went step by step through the process going from one step to another and they made good fries. Um, but, uh, ultimately they weren't using the gifts of the spirit and that falls into the category of 
They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And really, that's ultimately how um, the, the whole premise of this is that you get pulled back to the major culture of the day. You substitute spiritual gifts with philosophies of men. You substitute spiritual gifts with methods. You substitute spiritual gifts with uh, processes, with instruction, with um, ultimately everything but the spiritual gifts that is required to continue the body of Christ. And the body of Christ falls into disarray. The last thing is that as that happens, as the spiritual gifts depart and the um, cultures of the day and the philosophies of the day and the processes and traditions of the day, they then create substitutes. So they praise, going back to the beginning of uh, uh, what we talked about, they praise the sacrifice of their ancestors. The sacrifice that they didn't do themselves, but they set it up for a light. We had these ancestors. They did this sacrifice. So we're going to build a monument, a temple, a center, a place that you can pilgrimage uh, to remember the, the sacrifice and the gifts of the ancestors. Because today, those sacrifices aren't happening. And there's nothing to celebrate spiritually because it's all dried up wells today. So you pilgrimage to the certain sites. You could pilgrimage to um, any of these sites on this screen, whether it's Temple Square to see the lights at uh, Christmas time, or it's, it's Independence, or it's Mecca, um, or it's uh, the Vatican City, or it's Tibet. Ultimately, you're pilgrimaging to some site to reflect on the heritage that you have, although you are void of your own sacrifice and your own heavenly blessing. All right, so transition. So how do you get out of that? Well, you need to take your own uh, salvation seriously. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Um, we cannot depend on a process. We cannot depend on a institutional guaranteed salvation. Um, it must come from the individual. Um, and the goal is, is that we can individually receive loft out of the traditions, cultures, philosophies, and interests of our day whether we lived in Egypt 3,000 years ago or we lived in the, live in the United States today, we have the ability to pull ourselves out of the dominant culture. Now, if we can get a few people to do that with us, we can get a level of group salvation. Even if it's just a couple dozen or a couple hundred or a couple thousand, with a, a number of individuals reaching that, pulling themselves out, you can become a stranger within your own culture. And I'll read this from Ephesians. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God and are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are built together with a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I want to pause here. In this context, in this letter, apostles and prophets are not an office in a church hierarchy. It is related to spiritual gifts. And you are built on the foundation of those who have been brought back into the presence of God like the 70 elders who ascended the mountain with Moses and was brought back into his presence, like Joseph Smith, like Oliver Cowdery, like a number of individuals who are brought back into the presence of God and 
also receive the spiritual gift of being prophetic, being a prophet, a seer, a revelator, an actual seeing, actual revelations. That's the outcome right there. The outcome is that we are to take our salvation seriously and ascend the mountain and on the top of the mountain be brought back into the presence of God and ideally do that in a way where a number of individuals can achieve the same and there can be a level of group salvation. So becoming a stranger within your own culture is completely possible as an individual and as individuals coming together as a group. Um, as I, as you were saying this last scripture and this last slide, um, I was just thinking of how now, like, I, you know, with, I'll bring my daughter to school or I'll, kind of associate with people that are within the culture I live in and I feel like a complete outsider. I don't feel like I connect with people. Um, like I just don't. And then I meet a complete stranger who is kind of on the same path as I am and multiple complete strangers. I've never met them before in my life. And I'm so, like immediately I feel like we have this camaraderie and I feel like, we, I have known them forever. And it's like, they're my best friend and it's immediate. And I've, I don't think I've ever had that before. Like I, I've always kind of felt like a, a stranger <laughs> with everyone else. But, um, especially after coming out of the culture that I, I live in, um, I, I just don't associate, I just don't really click with anyone. And now it's like, I, I have people that I can, and I don't know, just, that was where my thoughts when you read that. I feel that now. Perfect. Well, the, the goal of this is that we move from Egypt into Israel and Israel has a couple missing pieces that a church uh, even a body of believers doesn't have. Um, there are layers or levels or pieces of covenants. And in some places you have certain pieces of covenants where in other places you have the complete covenant. So in the next podcast, we're going to talk about Israel, Israel, God is calling and how you can move from a body of believers into a covenant nation. And we'll go there. All right. Thank you. And uh, have a good night. Goodbye.